I've been very concerned about the scandal of illiteracy in the country today. The surveys show that about half of our population is either illiterate or only semi-literate. Uh, what does that mean? Well, really it means they can't read big words. Uh, they can only guess at one-syllable words by looking at the pictures on the page. Now, the trouble with people who have this affliction is that if they can't read big words, they cannot read America's founding documents. They can't read the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution because there are lots of three, four, and five syllable words in those documents. And they're words that don't lend themselves to drawing pictures. You see a picture of Dick and Jane and Spot, and you know the words say Dick and Jane and Spot. But how do you draw pictures of words in the Declaration of Independence, like liberty, allegiance, government, administration, representative, fundamentally? How do you draw pictures of the big words in the Constitution, like posterity, tranquility, authority, legislative, executive, judicial, establishment, limitations, qualifications, appropriations, impeachment, amendment, ratification. And the people who can't read big words can't read uh, those documents. They won't know why our Constitution is so different and why America is different from every other country in the world. Our United States Constitution ought to be in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest and the longest lasting constitution in all the world's history. And why is the United States Constitution the fountainhead of our great liberties, religious and political and economic? How did the Constitution enable us to prosper and grow and become the most powerful nation in the world at the same time that we retained our liberties? What is it about our Constitution that caused these happy results and made people from all over the world want to come to our shores? After we declared our independence in, in 1776, and after we won our independence in a bloody seven-year war, and after we persuaded the European powers to recognize our independence in the Great Treaty of Paris in 1783, the next question was, what were we going to do with our independence? What kind of government would we create? The great Constitutional Convention opened at Independence Hall in Philadelphia on May 25, 1787. The little room that they met in was just about as big as this corner of this room, where the piano and the first row of tables is. That's where the Declaration of Independence was signed and where the Constitution was written. Last summer at the uh, Republican National Convention, I went to make another trip to Independence Hall, the cradle of our land, and it's just amazing, this little small room uh, where they wrote the Constitution. Of course, this is the place where UNESCO now has the big bronze plaque declaring Independence Hall the uh, universal treasure of all mankind, or some such wording as that, which of course it isn't. It is uniquely American. In this little room uh, in Philadelphia in that summer, uh, non-air conditioned, Philadelphia has summer weather like St. Louis. It was hot and humid. And they closed the windows and they decided to keep their deliberations secret all things that are really impossible today. The 55 men from 12 states who met in that little room uh, were men of extraordinary vision and wisdom and commitment. They had a shared sense of mission and political values. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, who didn't attend, who was in France at the time, called them an assembly of demigods. The steady hand at the helm was General George Washington, who was unanimously elected the convention president. He didn't make any speeches during the convention, but the force of his personal leadership, plus his prestige as uh, commander of our victorious uh, revolutionary army, uh, kept them all on course. Uh, you talked about uh, perseverance, Todd. I, uh, years ago, I ran an American history essay contest for middle school children from all over the country for the DAR, and I had to supervise about uh, 50,000 essays. And we gave the uh, award to the little guy who wrote, 
Uh, the subject was George Washington, the little guy who summed up his essay saying, I admire George Washington because he never gave up. And that's right. That is the key to winning. And at this convention, the one thing that uh, it is recorded that George Washington said uh, was the great phrase that I have used as my theme for many of the things that I've done. If to please the people we offer that which we ourselves disapprove, how can we afterwards defend our work? Let us raise a standard to which the wise and honest can repair. The event is in the hand of God. Well, a senior citizen at that convention was Benjamin Franklin, age 81, diplomat, inventor, businessman, and world-renowned statesman. And after the first month had produced little progress, he made a speech to the delegates in which he said that if they failed to produce a workable constitution, future generations might conclude that mankind is incapable of self-government and then leave government to chance, to conquest, or to war, uh, which is actually the way most countries are formed. Uh, so Franklin, who wasn't a particularly religious man, urged the delegates to pray daily for the success of their mission. He said, I've lived a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. I firmly believe this, and I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall not succeed in building a constitution. The average age of the men at the Philadelphia Convention was only 41. But they were men who were well read in the great books of social, political, and economic theory. As uh, Mr. Chapman told us this morning, or this afternoon, uh, such as the Bible, the French philosopher Montesquieu, uh, the British lawyer Blackstone, the English writer John Locke, and the Scottish economist Adam Smith. They were also men who knew that freedom isn't free. Twenty-three of them who signed the Constitution had been soldiers during the American Revolution. But their study of history and first-hand experience had taught them about the failures of all previous types of government. On June 19th, uh, the 36-year-old Madison made a moving speech in which he argued that the convention uh, should come up with a constitution for the ages. And Madison became the principal architect of the constitution. We call him the father of the constitution. In those four hot months in Philadelphia in 1787, our founding fathers drafted a constitution that was original, it was unique, it was different from every other constitution that had ever been adopted. So tonight I would like to examine with you what I think are the six unique features of the constitution itself, the constitution that has enabled us to grow and prosper in freedom. The first principle of our constitution is the sovereignty of the people. The Founding Fathers proclaimed that in the first words, we the people of the United States do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. The American concept of political power is that government is the servant of the people, not their master. Our theory of government is fundamentally different uh, from the British Magna Carta, in which a reluctant king was forced to give up some of his rights to the people. It's our theory, as originally proclaimed in the Declaration of Independence, uh, that our rights come to us from our Creator, and then we give the rights we choose to the government. The second principle is our reliance on a written constitution. Our Founding Fathers gave us a government of laws, not of men, a government whose powers and limitations were defined on paper for everybody to see. They rejected the British notion of an unwritten constitution that can change with the whims of Parliament or the courts. Article 6 proclaimed our written constitution as the supreme law of the land. Now you have to watch very carefully what's being said on television today as we see the Clinton-Gore people who are trying to teach our country a falsehood, that our government is based on the will of the people. That is not the theory of our Constitution. 
We have a government of laws, not a government of the will of the people. The third principle of the Constitution is limited government, the concept that the federal government enjoys only the powers that are listed and no others. And the Constitution lists the specific powers that we the people granted to the federal government with a clear understanding that everything else remains in the hands of the people and the several states. And that there are some things that our government, even with the majority of the people, simply cannot do. The philosophical foundation of both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution is that individual rights come from our Creator and the government enjoys only those rights that we choose to give it. And the Constitution did establish the connection between it and the Declaration of Independence when it stated in the Constitution that they were then in the twelfth year of our nation, that being twelve years after the Declaration was signed. The fourth principle of our Constitution is the structure of government that we call the, de the separation of powers. Our Constitution separated the powers of government so that each section can serve as a check on the others, and so that one part can't gobble up the rest. James Madison believed that this original institutional design created by the Constitution uh, is the best way to achieve the twin goals of liberty and justice. He said, by contriving the interior structure of the government in a particular way, its several constituent parts may, by their mutual relations, be the means of keeping the others in their proper places. Now, you hear a lot of talk these days about this awful danger of gridlock. But gridlock was the way our government was designed. It's supposed to have gridlock. They're all supposed to be at each other's throats. And that is the way liberty is preserved. So don't be misled about those who bemoan the awful gridlock when nothing gets done. The most important division of government power was between the federal government on the one hand and the states on the other. The federal government was given specific powers, such as those over national defense, interstate commerce, with all the remaining powers reserved to the states and the people. For example, the states are supposed to be in charge of family law, most criminal law, education, uh, control over the cities, and land use. They're all reserved to the states. Unfortunately, in the last few years, we've had a tremendous drive to create thousands of new federal criminal laws. There's no excuse for this, and it's pushed through by a lot of Republicans, especially a lot of people who believe in strong law enforcement. There's no reason for these federal criminal laws. The only federal criminal laws we ought to have are laws against assassinating the president or hijacking a plane or uh, crimes on the high seas. But all these other criminal laws uh, should be state laws, and it is a great mistake to move them to the federal domain. And that has the uh, result of vastly increasing the jurisdiction of the federal courts. Secondly, the power that was granted to the federal government uh, was further divided into the three branches that we know, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial, each with its own specific powers. As James Madison bluntly said, the preservation of liberty requires that the three great departments of power should be separate and distinct. The functioning of our American government does not depend on the goodness of those who hold the office, but depends on the institutional restraints imposed by the separation of powers. Uh, Calvin Coolidge, which is, who was before even my time, but who's considered to be a pretty successful president, uh, was uh, once uh, believed to uh, have said that the ideal day in his life was when absolutely nothing happened. And that was a different view of government, but we prospered very well uh, with that type of president in the White House. Article I of the Constitution grants all of the federal government's legislative power to the Congress and specifies what Congress may and may not do. Article II 
defines the powers and duties of the executive branch headed by the president, and Article III uh, talks about the judicial branch headed by the Supreme Court. Now, this separation of powers is entirely different from the parliamentary system used in most other countries, such as the British, where the executive and the legislative branches are combined. The British Parliament can fire the Prime Minister and call for new elections, but our Congress may not fire the President except by impeachment. The President may not dissolve Congress as the British Prime Minister can dissolve Parliament and call a new ele election. The Founding Fathers emphatically opposed allowing the President to have this power over Congress, so it is a stumbling block. Uh, one day, uh, Bob Hope was introducing Ronald Reagan to a gathering, and uh, you know Bob Hope was a great golfer, and in the course of the introduction, he asked Reagan, uh, what is your handicap? And Reagan said, Congress. <laughs> well, that's, but that's the way it's supposed to be, friends. That's not an accident. Members of Congress may not serve in the executive offices, such as the cabinet, because that would violate the separation of powers principle. Madison argued that the accumulation of legislative, exec executive, and judicial powers in the same hands is the very definition of tyranny. After the three branches were separated into distinct units, the Constitution then made them function together in an intricate interlacing network of checks and balances. Thus, Congress can make the laws, but with minor exceptions, they do not take effect until the President signs them. The President can veto any act of Congress, but Congress can pass the law over his veto by a two-thirds majority in both houses. Please note, the President is not the Commander-in-Chief of the United States. He is the Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy when called into actual service. And only Congress may declare war. It was a constitutional travesty when the Republican Congress allowed Clinton get to get by with declaring and carrying out his unconstitutional war in Yugoslavia. And that is a terrible precedent. The President can sign treaties, but they are not valid unless ratified by two-thirds of the Senators. The Founding Fathers were very familiar with the way the British King had exclusive power to make treaties, and they did not want the American President to exercise this enormous power alone. The treaties that have been proposed during the Clinton administration are all terrible encroachments on the sovereignty of the, of the Americans and our capacity for self-government. And I would call to your attention my new briefing book called Allegiance, which sets forth many of these treaties uh, with bullet points of why they are a disaster and what we can do about them. And uh, it's terribly important for uh, Americans to understand what Bill Clinton did in the realm of treaties uh, as he is trying, as he said in his word, uh, to build a web of treaties which would take us into the 21st century and integrate our democracy with other democracies and our economy with other economies. Uh, every one of these treaties sets up a new global enforcement mechanism, and every one of them invades our own sovereignty in a different way. Uh, they're all bad, and they should all be rejected. Uh, another area that, uh, uh, in which uh, uh, Bill Clinton tried to abuse was this area of executive orders. And my briefing book, Allegiance, sets forth many of his uh, executive orders, which I do believe are unconstitutional too. The constitutional source for this power is, that, is just one line, that the president shall see that the laws are faithfully executed. But there's supposed to be laws before he issues an order about them. And what he tried to do was to make law uh, with an executive order and to spend money that was never appropriated by Congress. And we hope that the new Congress and the new president will rescind or repeal those executive orders. They should not...
They should not be, as uh, his friend Paul Begala said, uh, stroke of the pen, law of the land, kind of cool. It isn't kind of cool. It's unconstitutional. And the treaties in our form of government have a very special place. They are part of the supreme law of the land after being signed by the president and ratified by the Senate. So we have to be doubly uh, uh, worried about what is in these treaties. Now, the Supreme Court has the power of judicial review, but it's not supposed to have the power to legislate or to execute laws or to engage in policy making. Those powers belong to the other branches. The court can nullify a law that it judges unconstitutional. Now, all the federal judges, including the Supreme Court, enjoy life tenure. And that's given us a, a lot of difficulty. Uh, one day, somebody asked uh, President Dwight Eisenhower what was the biggest mistake I, he ever made. And he said there were two of them, and they're both sitting on the Supreme Court. And uh, once, once they get on the court, uh, they stay there forever, and they can make lots of mistakes. Now, as in many of these areas, the remedies are right there in the Constitution. And I do believe the Constitution has the remedies for our problems. Uh, the Congress has the constitutional power to limit the jurisdiction of the federal courts and to make all kinds of rules and regulations for it. Uh, even the Republican Congress has not been willing to do that. And we in Eagle Forum have been trying to encourage them and educate them to use their constitutional power uh, through our website and through our court watch committee, uh, which I hope you are supportive of. The fifth principle of the Constitution is economic freedom for every individual combined with the concept that our nation is one economic unit. Among the most important liberties that the Constitution was designed to protect uh, were the opportunities to engage freely in any business, trade, occupation, or profession, the right to own private property, and the right to make contracts that will be enforced. James Madison stated at the Constitutional Convention that the security of property is one of the government's primary objects, and both Madison and Hamilton believed that the right of private property ranks with the most important personal liberties. Other people around the rest of the world don't understand this. One of the UN treaties that fortunately has been rejected by every administration is the United Nations Treaty on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And the treaty specifically refuses to recognize the right to own private property as an economic, social, or cultural right. So we don't want that treaty. That's just one major reason uh, why we don't want that UN treaty. The right of private property means that after you work hard, you can retain your earnings for yourselves and your family and your children, except for the taxes that are fairly and justly imposed. But it means a lot more than that. Only a nation that enjoys economic freedom can enjoy political freedom. Only if you are secure in the ownership of your property and the right to choose your occupation and switch to another can you speak your mind and vote your choice without fear of having your livelihood confiscated. Ronald Reagan once pointed out that the big difference between the Soviet Constitution and the American Constitution was the Soviet Constitution supposedly guarantees freedom of speech and religion and assembly. But the American Constitution Constitution guarantees freedom after you speak and after you go to church and after you gather in an assembly. At the same time, Article 1 gave Congress the power to regulate commerce among the several states. And this Commerce Clause is essentially a negative clause uh, to prevent any state from imposing trade barriers against the other state. And that's, that's what enables every farmer and every craftsman to produce his goods with the certainty that he has available markets all over the country. Uh, Alexander Hamilton once said that the prosperity of commerce was a major goal of the Founding Fathers' efforts. The Constitution also has one very unique and original prov provision. 
It gave Congress the power to pass patent and copyright laws, thus ensuring that inventors and authors would have the exclusive right to the fruits of their labors for a limited time, after which they go into the public domain. This was absolutely original. It's different from every other country in the world. And I believe it is the mainspring of all the inventions that we've had that have made America such a wonderful place to live with such a high standard of living. Uh, more than 95% of the great inventions are American, and uh, that is what has, has transformed this country uh, to, to such prosperity. It was unique in our Constitution, and there are globalists all over the world who are working day and night to try to get us to harmonize our system with the rest of the world. Let them harmonize with us and find out what freedom is and what freedom can produce. So the combination of the freedom that the Constitution gave us was what unlocked all this great growth in economic power and prosperity uh, and, has, and what has given us more abundance than any nation in the history of the world. The sixth principle of the Constitution is representative government under constitutional procedures and restraints. The powers of government are exercised by our elected representatives, not by the direct rule of the people. The separation of powers mandates separate and distinct terms for each federal elective office. So we have a president elected for four years, senators for six years, and representatives for two years. And each office must be voted on separately. The president may not run as a ticket or a slate with a senator and representative because they're in different branches. This was an inspired division of power uh, in setting up Congress because it recognized the interests of the big states, the big population states, and the small population states. Every state, no matter what its population, has two senators. So now we have 100 senators for 50 states. The 435 representatives in the House are apportioned according to the state's population. And every 10 years we have reapportionment, uh, which we will have this year. All the tax bills originate in the House of Representatives, the body where every member must run for re-election every two years. And the Founding Fathers believed that oppressive taxes were the main cause of the revolution, and the two-year term of congressmen is one of our greatest guarantees of freedom. Madison pers per persuasively argued that frequency of elections is the cornerstone of free government. Uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, uh, in talking about uh, big government spending, once said, uh, if you want to cut off the pork, you have to stop feeding the hogs. And that's it. We've got to elect people who are going to vote to keep taxes down. Uh, the Electoral College, our system of electing American presidents, was established in Article II, and it is the mirror image of the brilliant compromise that gave us the two houses of Congress. The Electoral College allows all states, regardless of size, to be players in electing a president. It's the only function of our national government that is performed outside of Washington, D.C. No member of Congress or federal official is allowed to be an elector in the Electoral College. Now, because of third parties, it's very difficult for any candidate to receive a majority, that is, over 50% of the popular vote. And most of the presidential elections of our time, no one has received a real majority. The Electoral College is the mechanism that gives us a president who achieves a majority in a functioning electoral process. And that is why George W. Bush is president today. The Electoral College is particularly advantageous in cases of close elections because it saves us from the calamity of having to recount votes in all the states if we were to judge it by popular vote. Just imagine how dreadful the last few months would have been if we had had recounts in 50 states instead of just in Florida. Now, you notice that when uh, Hillary Clinton was elected to the Senate, her very first statement was she wants to get rid of the Electoral College. 
And of course, we cannot allow that to happen. It is one of the, well, the, the brilliant uh, contributions of the founding fathers in the uh, Constitution, and it has served us well, and has certainly served us well in this past election. The U.S. Constitution was as perfect as humans can make it. The British Prime Minister William Gladstone later called it the greatest piece of work ever struck off at a given time by the brain and purpose of man. The great French writer Alexis de Tocqueville pronounced it the most perfect constitution that ever existed. On the last day of the Constitutional Convention, uh, wise old Ben Franklin rose up to say, I doubt whether any other convention may be able to make a better constitution. It astonishes me to find this system approaching so near to perfection as it does. I wish that every member of the convention, who may still have objections to it, and some did, would with me on this occasion, and here come some of these long words again that you have to have read phonics to be able to read, a doubt a little of his own infallibility, and to make manifest our unanimity, put his name to this instrument. Well, they did. On September 17, 1787, the Constitution of the United States was signed by 39 delegates representing 12 states. Uh, you've all seen the picture of the famous chair that George Washington sat in as he presided over that convention. And Ben Franklin said on that day, pointing to the carving on the back of Washington's chair, I have often in the course of this session looked at that sun behind the president without being able to tell whether it was rising or setting. But now at length I have the happiness to know that it is a rising and not a setting sun. When the news rang out that the Constitution had been signed on September the 17th, 1787, many people referred to it as a miracle. In writing to Lafayette in 1788, George Washington wrote that it was little short of a miracle that the delegates from so many different states should unite in forming a system of national government. James Madison wrote to Thomas Jefferson, who was in France, that it was impossible to consider the degree of concord that ultimately prevailed as less than a miracle. Madison also wrote that he recognized a finger of that almighty hand in the writing of our Constitution. And then the ratification battle began. To promote ratification of the Constitution, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay wrote 85 articles explaining its terms. We know these articles as the Federalist Papers. Today, I guess we would call them policy papers or campaign speeches. And if you want to see how far the literacy of our country has declined, you can compare the Federalist Papers with their big words uh, with today's campaign speeches. As soon as the new government was formed, the first order of business was to write and ratify a Bill of Rights, and James Madison undertook that task too. There were some states that only ratified the Constitution with the promise that a Bill of Rights would immediately be added. Uh, the people feared that the government officials might twist the meanings of some of those words so as to deprive them of their rights. So Madison wrote the first ten amendments, which we call the Bill of Rights, and they include the familiar guarantees of freedom of religion, speech, press, assembly, and property, uh, the right to keep and bear arms, trial by jury, due process, and the rest. Uh, they were ratified uh, in December of 1791. Now, over the next couple of centuries, only 17 more votes were at, more amendments were added to the Constitution. And that is tremendous proof of the near perfection of the original document, its structural soundness, soundness and its lasting vitality. Six of those 17 amendments extended voting rights 
Those were questions not foreseen by the Founding Fathers, who thought that elections were state matters, not federal matters. And I urge you to watch out for these so-called reforms that are coming down the pike now, as people want to make changes in our election process as a result of our experiences of this immediately past uh, election. Uh, elections are state matters. We do not want Congress to dictate a national election. The Founding Fathers were writing a constitution not merely for their times, but for the future forever. In fact, Madison made this uh, what he thought was, I guess, a rash prediction. We framed a constitution that will probably be around when there are 196 million people. And of course, we now have about 260 million. The language of the constitution is so elegant. The language of the Constitution is completely sex neutral. Women have had every constitutional right since the day it was adopted in 1789, which of course blows away the uh, big argument of those who pushed the Equal Rights Amendment who told them that ERA was going to put women into the Constitution. Now there are a lot of people who don't like our Constitution. And ever since the regime of Franklin Roosevelt, there have been all kinds of groups that have been trying to change it, to write new constitutions. There have been big foundations that have made grants to groups to write new drafts of a constitution that they think will be an improvement. There were, there were powerful pressure groups that tried to plunge us into a constitutional convention, a new one, which is permitted under Article 5. And uh, this would open up a tremendous uh, uh, can of worms to change our Constitution. The people who want to change it, when you examine what they're after, uh, you can compare it with the uh, outline that I've given you of what is in the Constitution. They want to change all of those fundamental things. Of course they want to get rid of the Second Amendment. Of course they want to add the Equal Rights Amendment. But they want to do lots more than that. They want to get rid of our separation of powers and give us a parliamentary form of government. They're very eager to get rid of the Electoral College. They want to lengthen the terms of the House members. They want to have the President, a Senator, and Representative run as a slate. And one of the things they hate the most is the provision in the Constitution that says it takes two-thirds of the Senate to ratify a treaty. They're just extremely antagonistic to that. Now, Eagle Forum, you know, spent 10 years fighting and defeating the radical feminists with their attempt to change the Constitution by putting the Equal Rights Amendment in. And we now know and have all the proof at hand that what they really wanted and the reason they're for it and the reason they still flap around about it is that they want taxpayer-funded abortion and same-sex marriages. That's why they want it. So we're not going to let them do that. But Eagle Forum spent the better part of another 10 years fighting those people, a lot of them conservatives and Republicans, who wanted to plunge us into a constitutional convention. And we cannot permit that to happen. Unfortunately, I have now discovered that there is currently a lawsuit pending of a group that believes that we, there are 30, more than 34 states that have passed resolutions for a constitutional convention, and they're trying to get the courts uh, to go ahead and call one anyway, even though those resolutions pertain to many different subjects. There are a couple of websites up now rallying forces uh, to uh, plunge us into another constitutional convention. And I'm extremely concerned uh, because of the lot, a lot of disaffection over this election just passed that there may be people who will fall for some of those bad ideas. At the end of the Constitutional Convention, a woman asked Ben Franklin, uh, Mr. Franklin, what have you given us? And you know his famous reply, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. It was noteworthy that he said a republic. He didn't say a democracy. That word isn't mentioned. Uh, so it is a republic, but we need to keep it. And it is the most, I believe, the most perfect document that men could write. And it has survived and been so uh, remarkable in building and keeping our great country. 
In a great speech on the Constitution 50 years after it was adopted, President John Quincy Adams reminded us of our wonderful American blessings that are the result of our faithfulness to the principles of the Declaration of Independence, as he said, practically interwoven in the Constitution of the United States. He urged us to lay up these principles then in your hearts and in your souls. Teach them to your children. Write them upon the door plate of your houses and upon your gates. Cling to them as to the issues of life. Adhere to them as to the cords of your eternal salvation. So may your children's children, after another century of experience under our national constitution, celebrate it again in the full enjoyment of all its blessings. Now that's not just an old-fashioned view from the last century. In more recent times, here are the words of one of the most popular and successful of contemporary authors, James Mishner. The writing of the Constitution of the United States, he said, is an act of such genius that philosophers still wonder at its accomplishment and envy its results. They fashioned a nearly perfect instrument of government. What this mix of men did was create a miracle in which every American should take pride. Their decision to divide the power of the government into three parts, legislative, executive, judicial, was a master stroke. The accumulated wisdom of mankind speaks in this Constitution. Those are the words of James Mishner. Well, our task is to keep it, as Ben Franklin advised us. We have to keep it, we have to protect it. Protect it against judicial activism. Protect it against unconstitutional wars. Protect it against treaties that will enmesh us in a global web and encroach upon our right of self-government and sovereignty. Protect it against the unconstitutional executive orders. Protect it against these efforts for a new constitutional convention that could never, ever do as good a job as our founding fathers did. That's our task. I bring you the good news that the Constitution has within it all of the mechanism to solve our political problems today. Read it, study it, teach your children to read so they'll be able to read the big words in the Constitution, and then let's stand together to defend it against all its enemies. Thank you.